welcome everyone. And today we have uh, a talk by Luca Cassia, and he will speak about Kubernetes constraints and the algebra of Wilson loops in 3D. Uh, please go. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak here, uh, even if it is uh, digitally. So yeah, today I will talk. I uh, will tell you something about uh, recent work. Uh, well, uh, in the last two years uh, with my collaborators. Uh, so. This is work uh, that has been done with Maxim Zazin, uh, Rebecca Loding, who's an ex PhD student of uh, Maxim, and also with uh, Sasha Popolitov, who was a postdoc here in Uppsala as well. And these are the three papers of which uh, the talk, this talk uh, is based. So, as the title uh, uh, says, uh, what I'm going to tell, uh, tell you about is uh, the algebra of Kivira Zoro, and in particular, Kivira Zoro constraints, uh, and their application to derive uh, information about. Uh, will solve observables in uh, three-dimensional uh, supersymmetric field theories and uh, other uh, field theories in, uh, in three dimension. So let me jump into some quick introduction of the topic. So why are we studying this and what is the, the goal? Uh, first of all, we uh, the starting point of all of this line of research is uh, the, the technique of supersymmetric localization, which uh, since the last couple of decades has allowed uh, us to compute uh, partition functions and other VPS observables, uh, such as Wilson loops, for instance, in an exact way. So these are uh, mathematical techniques that give, uh, give you some uh, prescription to, to obtain this, uh, uh, this information about uh, the full theory in terms of, uh, as I said, the partition function. And uh, concretely, this uh, means that uh, what you have to do, you have to do, uh, for instance, if you do uh, Coulomb branch localization, you you will end up to, you will end up with an integral over the Lie algebra of the gauge group, and this means that you have to do some sort of uh, uh, matrix integral. Uh, this matrix integral is uh, is something which people have studied, uh, studied uh, uh, extensively, and in fact, it's called the uh, matrix models. Uh, you perhaps are familiar with this. These are integrals over random matrices, and many techniques are known since. Uh, I think even the 80s, 90s, the people who have been working on these matrix models uh, uh, a lot, and a lot of stuff is known. So what we can do, we can use these techniques uh, that were previously applied to just the theory of matrix models uh, to study these partition functions uh, in uh, various dimension uh, coming from a uh, supersymmetric localization. And what are these techniques? So first of all, these matrix models, uh, uh, oftentimes uh, uh, they, they possess uh, special properties like uh, integrability. And in fact, uh, you can uh, uh, sum all the correlators of the matrix model, and uh, perhaps you will be able to write down some something which is a generative function for all these correlator functions. And this uh, uh, generative function, they have the property of being a tau function for some uh, uh, integrable um, hierarchies of the type of KAP or KDB or something like that. Uh, and once you have that, you basically know everything about uh, your, uh, your model. And other techniques uh, are also known as well, which come from the theory of uh, uh, conformal field theories in two dimensions. In particular, many matrix models, they exhibit uh, uh, higher degrees of symmetry. Uh, and more specifically, you will find out that uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can have an action of the Virazoro algebra on these uh, matrix models. And uh, because this is uh, an infinite dimensional uh, uh, algebra, you will have infinitely many relations uh, among uh, your, uh, your uh, observables in the matrix models, and this will allow you to compute uh, uh, these integrals much more easily. And, and there are various other generalization of this, so not just the zero symmetry, but also W algebras and, uh, and other, uh, other te techniques uh, related to these algebraic methods. Uh, so the application of these uh, CFT methods to the study of supersymmetric uh, partition functions uh, is, a, is an idea who uh, has been called PPS-CFT correspondence. So the names come from uh, Nikita Nekrasov, who has been working on this uh, uh, a lot. But the many examples uh, of this uh, uh, general feature, they, they predate uh, the, uh, the work of Nekrasov. And in fact, uh, what you will find is that uh, uh, one of the main examples of, uh, and the most famous example of this uh, is called the AGT correspondence, where uh, on one side you have uh, uh, a for D uh, n equal to theory. So this is a supersymmetric gauge theory in four dimensions. 
And if you look at the partition function and some ob observables, which are BPS, uh, they will be in some sense dual to some quantities that you can compute in a 2D conformal field theory of Liouville or a Todd type. Uh, this is the, uh, let's say this is the famous IGT correspondence, which was uh, uh, discovered by Adai Gayot Chikawa and also independently by Villard. And if you want uh, to, to kind of understand, to get a feeling of what's uh, the mathematical statement behind this, uh, I can give you this formulation of the AGT. Uh, maybe this is not the uh, most famous one, but uh, the, the statement of the correspondent tells you that uh, on one side, on the BPS side, you have the instanton partition function of the Krasov. Uh, this is computed via supersymmetric localization. You will have to do some uh, integrals over the modular space of instantons in four dimensions. And once you compute it, you what you observe is that this is the same as the modulus square of a certain vector in a Virasor module. Um, and this vector is called Gayotto with a vector. It's a special uh, type of vector that satisfies certain properties uh, with respect to the action of Virasoro. But the point is that this is a quantity that you can interpret as uh, coming from a certain CFT. And in fact, this is uh, this is a certain state in a in a Liouville uh, CFT. Uh, if you go to higher rank, it's going to be based on Toda. And once you take the modulus, uh, you obtain the same uh, quantity that you computed before from the gauge theory side. So th this is one of the main examples of what uh, the BPS CFT correspondent uh, tells you. And since then, people have understood much better what AGT means and uh, other generalization. For instance, you can go to five dimensions. Uh, instead of computing uh, n equal for d n equal two, you compute five d n equal one gauge theories. Uh, the background now is uh, you can take uh, R4 times a circle. Uh, instead of taking uh, just an integral of the modular space on instant one, you get this. You do have to do some push forward of sheets. Uh, it's going to be some K theoretic computation. But the partition function that you obtain now is uh, again dual to some other object. But this time, this is no longer uh, just uh, some simple uh, vector in, the, in a, some state in a, Q, in a CFT. It's a state in a QCFT. So, so this is something which is. Uh, uh, which is more, uh, I say, is a more recent idea. This is called Q-Louville. Uh, and uh, the point is that there is a Q deformation going on on this side. So there is a parameter Q that deforms the algebra of Virasoro. And this is going to be the, the parameter Q for uh, Q Virasoro. So you might ask, uh, uh, well, what is this Q and uh, what is the, uh, the interpretation on the, CF, on the um, gauge theory side? Well, in the gauge theory side, this uh, Q uh, parameter is related to the geometry of the background. So as I said, the background was uh, R4 times S1. And then you can think that uh, you will have uh, parameters Q that uh, tell you something about the omega background that you have to put uh, in order to do localization. Uh, in this case, there will be two Qs, Q1, Q2, because we are in five dimensions. Uh, but the idea is that, is that uh, the geometry of the of uh, the gauge theory will tell will uh, will become a deformation parameter on the CF, CFT side. Okay, but now let's get to the main uh, point of uh, my talk, which is not a uh, 5D or four D version of the BPS CFT correspondence, but an instance which is a three-dimensional version. So uh, there is a correspondence now on one side. We have a gauge theory in 3D and equal to supersymmetric gauge theory, which is what we are going to be interested in and uh, related uh, uh, BPS observables. And on the other side, we have a QCFT, uh, which is some sort of uh, highest weight module for, uh, for a deformation of Virasoro, which we call Q Virasoro. And again, this Q parameter uh, on the gauge theory side will be related to the, to the geometry of the, of the three-dimensional background. So let me tell you more in details what kind of theories are we interested in. So uh, yeah, just uh, as a quick uh, uh, overview of the of the talk, the, of what I'm telling you today, I'm going to start by showing you what kind of uh, 3D n equal to uh, partition function we are looking at and how we can represent them as matrix integrals by using localization. Uh, so I'm not going to go through the details of localization, but I will tell you what, what is the type of matrix integrals that uh, we obtain. And uh, that's going to be important for the action of uh, Qubira Zorro later. And after I do that, I can show you what these Qubira uh, uh constraints uh, are and how do they look like and uh, what if they can be solved or not. Um, next, uh, uh, what uh, I will show you is that uh, there are certain BPS observables which are specific, uh, which are uh, special among all the other ones. And these are 
some sort of characters for the gauge group, and uh, they will the the averages of these uh, characters will uh, take take on some uh, special form, and this is related to a property called uh, super integrability, and in particular these characters for uh, Cuvier Zorro are going to be the McDonald functions, and finally I will discuss. Uh, uh, how all of this uh, uh, applies to uh, study of Jim Simon's theories and the refinement of Jim Simon's theory, and also a similar refinement of, of ABJ theory. Okay, so this is the, the main uh, idea of uh, the talk. So uh, maybe if there are no questions, I will jump in. Okay. So uh, we start by looking at 3D gauge theories of this type. So we have uh, one gauge group, uh, which is of a UN type. Uh, the action is uh, uh, the type of Jan Mills plus Jan Simons. And the background is uh, a disk times S1. And as I told you, there is a Q parameter appearing. And this Q is related to the fact that this D2 is not just a, a product with S1, but it's a vibration. So you fiber the D2 over this one. And as you go along the S1 in the base, uh, you get uh, some sort of holonomy. And this holonomy is going to be given by this parameter Q. And I'm sorry, uh, can I ask yes. a question? So you are not considering conformal theory. So conformal theories are not special case. Yeah, no, it doesn't need to be a super conformal theory in three dimension. OK, so that's why you, you include Young Mills in general, right? Yes, yes. OK. So. Yeah, conformal symmetry will appear on the other side of the correspondence, uh, but it's a different version of uh, conformal symmetry. Okay, so this is our background, and the, the content of uh, the matter content of the theory is described by this quiver. So we have a, a node for uh, the U, UN gauge group, uh, we have a node for the for a Plemo symmetry NF, and therefore we will have a NF fundamental chiral multiplets. Uh, this is an n equal to 3D theory, so we have this car uh, multiplet that can couple with the vec with the with the gauge symmetry, but also we have one adjoint chiral uh, uh, field, uh, this uh, this loop that goes from uh, this node to itself, and this chiral uh, uh, adjoint field uh, will will also have some uh, some ma uh, mass parameter that I will tell you later. And because, uh, as I said, the action is of the young Mills and Chen Simons type, we also uh, can introduce a Chen Simons level and a uh, Fayetiliopoulos parameter because the group is UN, so there is a U1 center symmetry in the gauge group. And these are the two parameters in red that will denote uh, this, uh, uh, these two terms in the action. Okay, so once we do localization, uh, we end up with this partition function. So localization has been done uh, for this type of model and this type of background by being the multiple Pasquetti. And the result takes the form of this uh, matrix integral. Uh, this is a contour integral. I'm uh, not specifying the contour because uh, it's, not that, uh, it's not important for the, our discussion, but typically you, you can take uh, simply some uh, um, unit circle uh, around the origin. So you have an integral over the Xi. Xi are the gauge variables, or uh, if you want, these are the Coulomb branch parameters. Uh, they are restricted to the to the Cartan of the of the gauge group. Then you have a classical uh, contribution uh, for the action, which contains the Jan Simons and the Fayetti Diopolos term. And then you have the one loop determinants. So you have the one from the vector and the joint. So in the numerator you have the the vector contribution, and the denominator you have the joint uh, Carroll field, where t is the mass of, of this uh, of this Carroll vector. Sorry, this Carroll uh, multiplet within the joint. And then additionally, you have the fundamental, the one loop determinants for the fundamentals, which are given by these uh, factors, where u, uh, sorry, u are the, the masses of each one of them. So you have uh, nf of them. Uh, so this is uh, a list of the parameters you can see. And if you're not familiar with the notation, I wrote here the definition of this function, this xq infinity is, uh, is called a q pocammer or a, or a q factorial function. And it's defined just as an infinite product of one minus q to the nx, where x is the argument. So why, um, uh, okay, so this is uh, the basically the starting point of our, uh, uh, of our discussion. We know that the localization give us this result. So we need to study this uh, matrix integral. And uh, in particular, we can also observe that uh, if you want to insert, insert uh, uh, Wilson loop observables, uh, 
that preserve supersymmetry, in particular the one, one half PPS uh, operators. Then uh, upon localization, this uh, will come down to introducing a uh, sure polynomial inside of the, of, of the integral that we, we defined before. Uh, where sure is just a homogeneous polynomial in the uh, Coulomb branch parameter like psi, and it's labeled by the representation of the Wilson loop. So this lambda here is a partition, uh, and it is well known that uh, characters of the QN uh, gauge group are given by sure functions. So this is why this function appear. So if we want to know about uh, th this theory, what we have to do, we have to compute uh, these expectation values of, uh, of uh, sure functions and the product. Uh, and what we, what we can do in order to do this computation, uh, we can, uh, uh, we can do something which is very common in matrix mod and uh, in the study of matrix model. So we collect uh, all these Wilson loop uh, uh, operators into a generating function. Uh, this is a bit tactical. Uh, this is just uh, uh, a way to resum everything together. But at the end of the day, what we have, we have a sum over all possible expectation value of sures for every representation lambda uh, multiplied by some generating variables uh, which are combined together to form another sure. And then we're just using uh, some, uh, something called a Cauchy identity to rewrite it in, uh, in this nicer way. And what you can observe is that when you take uh, uh, derivative respect to the, this auxiliary uh, a variable, which are called times, this tau k, then basically what you're doing is bringing down power sums in the axis, which are defined here. So these are some elementary symmetric function of the x. So by taking derivative respect to the taus, you can basically reproduce all possible correlation functions of your theory. So the idea is that if we manage to compute this z tau, so this generating function, or at least the coefficients in the expansion, then we know everything about uh, our, uh, our theory. And in particular, because uh, sure functions are a basis of the ring of symmetric functions in, uh, in this variable x, uh, uh, if you know the expectation value of these sures, you know expectation values of any other symmetric function. So every other symmetric function f will be uh, just a linear combination of these sures. In particular, also the product of two sures. So if you take two sures and you multiply them, you can also expand it in uh, just as a linear combination of other sures. So the full algebra of Wilson loops will be encoded into uh, these uh, expectation values uh, that they brought here. And therefore, you can sum everything into the, the tau, into this uh, generating function z tau. Okay, so since we want to know about uh, this function, we would like to make this computation and compute all these integrals. But doing these integrals by hand or analytically is very hard. And uh, the main problem is that uh, if you increase the rank, uh, then you will have many, uh, more integration to take, and this can be a combinatorial nightmare. Uh, and we don't want to do that. So we want some other algebraic procedure that uh, will give us the same result. So will will allow us to compute these coefficients, but without uh, uh, having to to take this integral explicitly. And in particular, uh, a procedure such that this uh, dependence on the rank n uh, will be so some will be parametric uh, in a sense, uh, so that it's easier to compute. And let me just be clear: we are not. Uh, uh, we're not going to do some large and limit uh, or, uh, other simplification of that type. We want to compute this uh, correlation function uh, exactly at every finite value of n, uh, let's say integer, but every finite n. So what can we do? So what can we do is uh, we can derive a set of word identities for this uh, generating function that uh, uh, relates the, the correlation function among each other. And once we know this, uh, these identities, which uh, take the form of either differential or difference equation for the generative function zero to tau. Uh, then we solve this equation, and perhaps by solving this equation, we can find the same information without compute, having to compute the integral. And what's the advantage of this method is that uh, n, uh, meaning the rank of the gauge group, uh, enters the equation just as a parameter. And therefore, if you set n equal to 1 million, uh, it will be just as uh, difficult to, for you to solve the equation as for uh, one or three. So this is the main advantage of this method. So let me show you how, how to do this in a simple example. So if we go to just uh, some uh, simple classical matrix model, let's say it could be this uh, Gaussian matrix model, then these uh, virus, uh, sorry, these word identities are obtained by inserting some uh, some operator which takes the form of a total derivative in the in the x variables. 
excited with the matrix interval. So this is the example. We have this operator total derivative plus uh, the, the usual integrand, and also this additional factor. Uh, if you take compute this integral, then clearly this must be zero because of, uh, uh, with, with just Stokes theorem, you're integrating a total derivative. If there is no boundary or no boundary contribution, then uh, this is gonna be zero. But then you, you can also take the derivative of this object and rewrite everything as a, as a relation between correlators. And then the idea is that you want to solve those relations. And because we are inserting the, this uh, specific operator here, you, you can observe that this is the same as taking the, uh, some sort of lead, lead derivative along uh, a vector of this type. And it is well known that this, uh, these vectors, they commute among each other to form a, a Virasoro algebra. And therefore, this is why these word identities are called Virasoro constraints. Of course, you could uh, define some more general word identities, but today I'm just gonna discuss uh, uh, this type of uh, uh, identities. Okay, so let me, be even more concrete. So we take the explicitly the generating function for a Gaussian, uh, sorry, a Gaussian integral in uh, just one dimension. So this is very easy. You could do this integral uh, in your mind, but let me just explain the, the, the strategy. So we have the integral, we insert this operator derivative together with the X. So we have this here. We know that this should, this uh, at the end of the day will be zero, but let's take the derivative. We rewrite everything as a, uh, as a sum of combination, some sort of linear combination of the correlation functions of the model. So these are the, the momenta of the matrix integral. And because the tau function is defined in such a way that when you take derivatives with respect to times, you reproduce correlation functions, you can rewrite all of these relations as some sort of differential operator acting on z tau on this generative function. So the idea is that now uh, this operator. Uh, which depends on n. So there will be a, an infinite family of such operators. They all annihilate the partition function, sorry, the generating function. And if you know uh, what is the kernel, the common kernel of all these operators, you basically determine this, uh, this z. And this is what we, we're gonna do. Okay, so that was a simple example for the clas classical matrix model of uh, Gaussian type. But in this case, our matrix model is much more uh, complicated. So we have this uh, cubocamera function appearing everywhere. So the question is, what is the, the, the right operator to put inside to, in order to derive these, uh, uh, these constraints? And uh, well, so because the, uh, the model is in some sense q-deformed, there is a q-deformation appearing in uh, these uh, cubocamers, then the, the guess is uh, that there should be also some q-deformation of the operator. Instead of having a derivative, we have a q-derivative or some, something like that. However, there is no just uh, one guess for uh, what this operator should be. However, uh, luckily people before us, they thought about this, in particular Miron or Morris and Zinkevich, they came up uh, with a proposal. And, uh, and in fact, they wrote down this operator, which looks very complicated, but let me just uh, explain to you what, what it means. So we have uh, this tqx, which uh, is a finite shift operator that sends xi, the variable xi into q times xi. So you multiply uh, one variable at a time by q. And then there is gonna be also some other rational function of the, x, uh, of the xi and the t. So this is a bit complicated, uh, but the idea is that once you take uh, the q goes to one limit, uh, and in particular, T and Q goes to one limit, then you see that this term, so this uh, shift operator minus one will basically tend to zero. And if you take the limit correctly, you basically reproduce a derivative, the usual derivative, uh, while this rational function uh, just becomes the identity because if T is equal to one, then uh, as you can see, everything simplifies. So you recover the usual uh, Virasoro generators. Uh, the point of this function that, uh, that we introduce is, uh, is that uh, it should talk nicely to the to the measure of the integral, uh, and this is uh, complicated to see. But uh, you you can check that once you put this here, uh, it will give you better uh, um, a better formula for your uh, for your uh, for your word identities. So the uh, for your constraints, and also let me make an observation uh, why this operator is so nice. Well, because uh, in the integral uh, we have this cubo camera functions and this cubo camera function they satisfy some nice property with respect to the action of uh, the shift operator so if you take x and you shift by q then this cubo camera is again itself uh, but then you have to multiply by one over one minus x which is a nice uh, rational function and this is basically the 
the whole idea behind uh, uh, defining the operator in this way. Uh, okay. So now, now that we figure out what is the operator, we just need to plug it in, compute uh, this uh, Q derivative of uh, the action of this Q difference operator, and try to rewrite everything as a, 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 as a correlation function so that we can uh, rewrite the equation as some sort of a partial differential uh, uh, operator acting on uh, the generated function, or more generally, it's gonna be some, uh, some different, finite difference operator. Uh, but in order for this to, to, be, to be possible, uh, we, need to, we need two conditions. Well, we, we need one condition to be satisfied and that uh, every term in this, uh, in, uh, in our constraint should be polynomial in the X variables because otherwise we cannot reproduce, his, reproduce it as a derivative in, in, the, in the time style. And uh, in order to, for this to be possible, we need to make sure that uh, terms like one over X will not appear. And unfortunately, these terms do appear, uh, specifically if uh, the, we take the n equal minus one constraint. However, we can easily fix this problem by just setting the coefficient of this term to zero. And, uh, and therefore, we need to set uh, a specific value of the Fayette-Heliopoulos parameter. So uh, if we set this parameter to this particular combination of the rank and uh, the parameters t and q, then this parameter will, sorry, this uh, contribution one over x will, be not, will not be there, and therefore, uh, we are safe, so this constraint will be well defined. And then something similar happens uh, if we allow for a generic uh, non-zero chain Simons level, then we'll, there will be some logarithmic term in X. Uh, and again, this cannot be reproduced uh, as derivatives in times. And therefore, we we have to put a K to K the chain Simons level to zero. So these right now are two technical uh, restriction. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have a physical intuition for why one should do this. Uh, but I'm sure that there should be some deeper, uh, uh, deeper explanation for uh, for setting these two com these two parameters as they are. Okay, so now that we know that our constraints are well defined, uh, we can write them down. And uh, okay, the expression is uh, not very nice, but the idea is that uh, for each n we can write an equation of the form some operator t n acting on z equal to zero. So z now is the generative function. And you can think of it as a, as a vector in uh, some representation of uh, some algebra. This algebra will be the Pirazoro, the Q-Pirazoro algebra, Q deformation of Pirazoro. These Tn are the generators of this algebra, at least the positive ones, including the minus one and zero. And, and therefore this is a, a, a generalization of the usual Pirazoro constraint where we show that uh, uh, the z, the general function, can be thought of as an, uh, the highest weight state in this uh, in this module for uh, Q beta zero. And then what you can do is you can take all these generators, you you can resum them uh, together with uh, some uh, some variable, some uh, auxiliary variable z. You you construct uh, this current, it's called t, and this current t will be some the stress uh, energy tensor in a Q deform CFT, and it takes the form that I write. Uh, uh, just below in the in this slide. As you can see, it's a very complicated operator, but the main point uh, that you should uh, take from this slide is that uh, there are two terms. They look like some sort of uh, uh, vertex operators. So there are a multiplication by T, well, let's say bosonized version of a vertex operator. There's multiplication by time and a derivative in time, but because they appear in the exponential, these are gonna be some shift, uh, uh, some shift operator. Um, and then here in the red, uh, uh, below, I, I emphasize this additional term, which breaks kind of the symmetry between the two terms. And these terms, uh, as you can see, contains the masses U for the fundamental fields. And in fact, this is a kind of a, a deformation coming from the from, in, from introducing these uh, these masses. So as you can see, this is going to be some sort of polynomial of degree n. Uh, but this is very important because uh, uh, the relations that are induced by these uh, uh, by these uh, Kubilazor constraints can only be solved if this term is here. Uh, if not, then the, uh, the problem is that the, we have a, a set of relations uh, that inter induce a recursion, which is uh, basically doesn't have any, any solutions or at least not non-trivial solutions. So let me show you how uh, this algebra uh, arises and what, what are the properties of this algebra. So um, I'm assuming not, uh, 
not many people are familiar with this, so I'll give you just a very brief presentation. So Kubirozoro was originally defined by Frank R. Uh, by looking at the representation theory of quantum groups. Uh, so basically what they were doing, I think they were, okay. Uh, let me just keep all the details, but let me just tell you that uh, uh, they came up with this uh, deformation of uh, Virasoro, and in particular, the uh, realization was uh, taken at a specific uh, point, which I think it was the, um, well, a certain limit where uh, the parameter T was set to, uh, to one, if I remember correctly, and a more general uh, uh, definition of Q Virasoro, of the deformation of Virasoro, was given later by Shirashi, Kubo, Wata, and Odake, this was in 95, uh, and this was based on their work on uh, quantum integrable models. And the idea is that uh, this uh, QB Razoro or QT, the form V Razoro, uh, is a McDonald refinement uh, of the V Razoro algebra. So uh, if you're familiar with the theory of quantum integrable models, you have a uh, standard Calogero Moser system. Uh, you can uh, kind of do a McDonald deformation. Uh, you end up with uh, some sort of McDonald Rosener system. And this algebra is coming uh, from uh, the study of those kind of models. And what is the relation defining this algebra? Well, this algebra is associative. However, it's not uh, uh, it's not an Lie algebra. And you can see this by computing the commutator between the generators. So if you take a generator Tn and Tm, you take the commutator, uh, you end up with this uh, complicated looking formula on the right hand side. But as uh, as soon as you look at this term, you will realize that uh, the the commutator is not linear in the generators so because here this term is quadratic this is also quadratic and therefore they can, this cannot uh, satisfy the, uh, the axioms of a Lie algebra however this is still an associative algebra and uh, the main property well it has many properties but uh, what we're interested in is that uh, it reproduces the the constraint the word identities that uh, we computed before and this one we we check explicitly uh, but also, uh, what is interesting is that uh, when you send Q and T to one, you will reproduce again the standard Virasoro algebra. So, uh, and this is just uh, just to say that this is uh, one of the, the this is the correct uh, Q deformation of uh, Virasoro. So let's go back to the our constraints that we computed for our uh, 3D partition function, and let's try to solve them. Uh, how do we solve them? Well, this is a uh, just a uh, uh, tedious computation, but it's very simple. You take the genetic function, you expand in times, and then you look, you get some relation for the coefficients, and then you solve, you start solving them uh, recursively. Uh, you will find that uh, this system of equation is uh, is uh, upper triangular, so there's going to be some upper some upper triangular operator acting on the, on the z tau with respect to a certain ordering of the partition, and uh, and according to the value of the uh, number of uh, flavors, so this is uh, the number of uh, fundamental uh, current fields, uh, the, the kernel of this, oper of this operator uh, will have different dimensions. In particular, uh, just by explicitly solving this equation, you will find that uh, for NF equal to one and two, so for one flavor or two flavors, uh, the kernel is exactly one dimensional, which means that the solution is unique up to normalization. So you look at this equation and you can solve them completely up to basically uh, knowledge of the correlation function of the identity. However, if you start looking at higher, uh, higher rank for the flavor group, so for an F great, equal or greater than three, then uh, you immediately see that the kernel is, uh, is much larger, is actually infinite dimensional. And uh, this relation is still there, uh, but the, you cannot solve them completely. So you cannot find a full solution uh, because there you need some uh, some more initial data to, to put there, and in particular you need infinitely many uh, such uh, correlators to that you have to plug in by hand to, in the recursion in order to to solve it. And just as an example, if you look at uh, the n equal n f equal to three case, uh, you can solve for every correlator up to the correlators of the form p one to the n, where this is the power sum. So basically, this is the sum of the x's. Uh, so this is very surprising because physically we don't see much difference between uh, one and two flavors and three or four and so on. But uh, if you look at the, this constraint uh, concretely, you will find this kind of, uh, there is a threshold after two, uh, everything breaks down. So we would like to understand what is, uh, what is the reason for this from a physical point of view. And uh, unfortunately, we do not have a physical understanding right now. 
But what we can do is we can uh, try to understand this from the point of view of the usual matrix models. So what we do is we take the semi-classical limit. So this is also called uh, the conformal limit where we send Q and T to uh, one. So let's say we take uh, Q as E to the some parameter H bar, which is very small, and T is equal to Q to the beta, where beta is kept fixed, and we take the limit Q and T goes to one. If you do that, uh, the limit is uh, defined because of the masses, but you can quickly fix this. You, you rescale the masses in this way. So basically you, you have this, uh, this term Q to the K minus one. Uh, and of course, when Q goes to one, this goes to zero, but it goes to zero in a, in a nice way, let's say, uh, because now uh, what you have is that the, the constraints, they reduce from Q virazor to the standard virazor constraint in this limit H bar goes to zero. And the matrix uh, integral reduces to a standard emission matrix integral. So let me show you how this goes. So our uh, generating function can be expanded. Well, actually, this is the partition function itself can be expanded around uh, H bar equal to zero. And the first term, the leading term, is going to be this uh, emission integral with a beta deformation, where remember beta was uh, the ratio of the log of t divided by log of q. Uh, together with a potential of, uh, of the form V, which is uh, written in terms of these uh, reparam uh, reparametrized masses. So this G1, G2, Gn, they can be thought of as uh, basically coming from the value of the masses uh, of the fundamental fields. And we have one of them for each, uh, uh, for each uh, fundamental, and therefore this polynomial, this uh, potential would be polynomial of degree Nf. And now we can start to ask ourselves, oh, well, well What's the difference about uh, what is the difference between the one, two, and three and higher? And uh, well, the answer now uh, is well known because if you take uh, an f equal to one, well, you know, the potential is linear, and this matrix model is of Wisher Laguerre type, and it is uh, it's known how to solve this model. For an f equal to two, this is just a Gaussian matrix model. Again, the solution is very, is very well known. This is the most studied matrix model of, of, of all. But then if you start looking at an f equal to three and higher, then this becomes uh, uh, some sort of generalization of an airy, uh, airy type integral. And it is known that in this case, uh, there are some issues in the defining the integral because of the contour. There are multiple choices of the contour. And again, if you look at uh, the airy equation that defines this integral, that has multiple choices independent of each other. So basically, this is the same type of feature that we, we observed uh, by solving the qubit as our constraint. So there will be some sort of initial data that one needs to specify. Otherwise, the constraints themselves cannot be solved uh, uh, explicitly. And in the literature on matrix model, this has been called the uh, di digraph Waffa phases. So basically, when you go, when you choose one contour uh, or another, you go in different phases for your uh, for, for your theory. So let's say that this is kind of uh, an intuitive way to understand why the solution only exists for an f equal one and two. However, this is still not a physical explanation from the point of view of the three-dimensional theory. So uh, this is still an open question for us, but at least uh, uh, we have a consistent picture from the mathematical point of view. Okay, so uh, now that we have our solution, uh, at least in an F equal to one and two case, what we can do is we can, uh, we can, we can try to look for applications. And uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, one application is to compute the averages of characters. So if you look at characters of UN, uh, these are the sure polynomials. So basically these are gonna give you the Wilson loop operators, the expectation value of loop operators. And uh, it is known uh, that for a standard matrix model like uh, the Hervitian Gaussian matrix model, these uh, sure polynomials, uh, they satisfy certain a uh, special property called super integrability. Namely, if you take the average in the matrix model of this Schur polynomial, which is a character for UN, you will end up uh, with uh, another character, namely the same character. So this is a very simple expression. And the question is, can we do the same for uh, our, uh, our QT deformed matrix model? And what are the characters? Well, again, Morozov, Opolitov, and Shakirov, they conjecture uh, that uh, for QT deformed matrix models, then super integrability should hold for uh, QT deformed characters. And these QT deformed characters are nothing but the McDonald polynomials. So these are uh, uh, again labeled by, P, uh, by lambda, so the partition. They depend on polynomially on the X variables, but they also have uh, some coefficients uh, that depend rationally on Q and T. 
So unfortunately, they they didn't prove this uh, property, and they they didn't uh, they didn't know how to derive this property. But they gave us uh, some intuition on how to to compute it. And now that we have a full solution for our matrix model, Q to the power matrix model, we can just try and plug it in, uh, plug the uh, McDonald polynomial inside of the of the matrix integral, compute the expectation value using our solution of Q beta zero, and try to check if this is uh, this type of property is correct. And what we find is that uh, let's say an f equal to two, which is uh, one of the two cases which we can solve, then this identity should hold. So let me explain. On the left-hand side, we have expectation value of, of, the, of our uh, character. On the right-hand side, we have the same character. So, but it, now it appears three times. So there is a, a ratio of two of the character of the same uh, partition. Uh, and the, all three characters are evaluated at some specific point. So basically, these are going to be polynomial function, but you have to evaluate them at, at some uh, substitute in the axis to some combination of uh, the masses, u1 and u2, and also the parameters uh, t and uh, n. Oh, sorry. So, uh, and just to be clear, this, uh, uh, this type of identity, uh, which is the QT, the form version of the superintegrability, uh, is just a conjecture right now. Uh, we have been able to check it for a high degree in lambda in the partition, uh, but unfortunately we do not know of uh, uh, any way how to prove this uh, analytically. So I think there are some proofs, uh, some analytical proofs for the classical case, but for the QT case, this is still an open problem. However, you can uh, uh, you can check up to a very high degree. I think uh, we checked up to degree nine in the partition, in the size of the partition, and this is a very some very non-trivial checks. So we are quite confident that these uh, these formulas should hold. And uh, okay, sorry. Uh, so why is this formula very uh, so interesting and so important? Well, first of all, it's a curious formula. Uh, the last term is the quantum dimension of the representation. This is some object uh, which is very well known from the study of representations of quantum groups. But from our point of view, this is important because uh, this gives us a close formula. To, to write this correlation function of, of McDonald polynomials. And because they form also a basis for the ring of symmetric function, then we can use this to write down an explicit formula for uh, the generating function z tau. So using this, this formula here, we can basically tell what are the every coefficient of z tau uh, in, a, in a close fashion, close and exact. Okay, so before I go on, are there any questions? Okay, so the next uh, step, so the next thing we can do is we can uh, basically try to reproduce the same, but on a different background. So, so far, what I told you was uh, the theory on the disk times as well. Uh, can we do the same for other, uh, for other theories? And uh, the, the most obvious candidate now is the theory on a three sphere. So the localization of three sphere uh, has been done by Amos and Michel Lee. And, uh, but the basic idea that uh, we're going to use right now is that the sphere, the three sphere, can be thought of as the, uh, the disjoint union of two solid tori. And each one of them is basically a copy of disk times S1 with a different parameter. So on one side, you have Q1, Q2. And when you join them, you join them together using uh, some sort of S duality uh, twist of the boundary. Uh, which, uh, as you can see, you will have uh, the, the two parameters k1 and k2 are related by exchanging this parameter omega1 and omega2 at the exponent. So these are uh, inverted. And in fact, uh, once you look at uh, the result of localization, you end up, you, you will find this uh, matrix integral where uh, it basically has the same, uh, the same uh, schematic structure as before, but now every cubic camera is substituted by a double sign function. This is some special function that's related to, again, localization on the three sphere. And the main property is that uh, one can think of each double sign as a product of two cubocamers, which is a, uh, with a Q parameter uh, that uh, are different on the two sides, but they are related by some sort of S duality. And therefore, one can think of this partition function as the gluing together of two copies of the partition function for just one T2 times S1. And here is a list of all the parameters, but basically it's the same structure as before. And in fact, uh, once you do this, you again write down this operator that does the shift, you derive Q0 constraint, 
and what you can show, and this we have done in this paper with uh, uh, Rebecca Lodi and Popolito and Zegzin, is that uh, the generic function of Wilson loops, uh, which now has dependence on two different sets of times, because we are, can have one Wilson loops in one copy of the disk times this one, and now Wilson loop in the other copy. Uh, well, then now this generic function is formally just the tensor product of two copies of the genetic function for one of the of the two uh, solid tori. And because of this, uh, you will have two commuting copies of QB Razoro acting uh, independently, one on one side and one on the other. And they commute because the parameters Q1 and Q2 are uh, kind of independent of each other at the algebraic level. And uh, this, this structure was already observed uh, before in, the, uh, in this paper by Niedel in, uh, Nier in Zadzin. It was called a modular double because of the, the fact that double sign can be thought of as the Padilla quantum modular double function. And uh, but however, here we give a, com a concrete uh, representation in terms of, uh, of matrix integrals and their solution. Uh, there are some subtleties in the case of the sphere that one needs to take care of. So for instance, in this case, uh, uh, you need to fix the chain simons level to a specific value, which is the number of flavors divided by two. And the reason is similar to before, but uh, the equation that one needs to solve are slightly more complicated. And again, one needs to fix the Fayetteliopoulos to a precise uh, value again, uh, which is given by something called balancing condition. And uh, here it is. So the Fayetteliopoulos needs to be fixed uh, to uh, this combination of the uh, squashing parameters of the sphere, the mass of the joint, uh, number of uh, uh, colors, uh, and all the other parameters, the mass parameters, for instance. And the name balancing condition comes from the fact that uh, in the study of uh, these uh, double sign functions, uh, people uh, usually uh, need to impose this condition for, uh, for certain integrals to be well-defined. So I suppose there is there should be some connection with the, with the mathematical side of uh, the, the story. Okay, and lastly, I want to tell you about uh, uh, another model that we can solve. So this is uh, no longer a supersymmetric gauge theory, just a chain simons theory, but it's a refinement of chain simons. So this chain, uh, refined chain simons theory was, uh, let's say it was conjectured by Aganaji Shakiro was, uh, so actually they gave a definition for the partition function, but uh, until now there is no uh, definition in terms of Lagrangian field theory. So we don't know what's the field theory corresponding to this, uh, but we know uh, how to compute observables and how to compute uh, uh, the partition function, the Wilson loops, uh, uh, because uh, we can use the correspondence with the uh, Wetzelwino Witten uh, models in two dimensions. So for usual chain simons, uh, we can write the partition function in terms of S modular S and T matrix. And for the function simons, what you need to do is to take S and T and do a McDonald uh, deformation of those. This uh, was already worked out by Kirillov, I think in the 90s, uh, this deformation of the S and T matrix. So what Aganajic and Shakirov did was to kind of reproduce the computation of the partition functions for chain simons, but with these deformed matrices. And if you do it, you end up with this kind of object. So this is a matrix object computed uh, from the T and S matrix. So T is just a diagonal, so it's just an overall factor. But the idea is that this S matrix is reproducing the, the kind of S duality that, that uh, you need in order to glue two solid tori into a sphere. So this zero is the vacuum vector corresponding to uh, one solid torus, and this vacuum, this other one is the vacuum vector of another solid torus and the S matrix uh, will glue them together along the common boundary but up to a, a twist uh, of the boundary itself so that you end up with a sphere. If you do that, uh, again, Shakirov show that uh, the integral that you end up with is of this type. Again, it's written in terms of these cupel camera functions. And uh, if, you, if you remember, this is basically very similar to the type of partition function that we were looking at in three dimension with supersymmetry. But now this is no longer supersymmetric, it's just chain simons or refined chain simons. So the this kind of uh, uh, QT deformed van der Monde measure is still the same, but it has a, a kind of uh, some, some weird uh, potential term. Well, not really weird, it's the same as the one for chain simons, but it's logarithmic in the X. So the question is, can we can we write down QB constraints for this model as well? And 
And this is what we did. So let me just show you how this goes. So physically, Q and T now can be identified with parameters coming from the function Simon's theory. So Q is uh, this exponential of these parameters, where K is the level, N is the rank, or in this case, is, is equal to the dual coxeter number, and beta is the deformation parameter, and T is the same, but with a beta in, in the numerator as well. And then uh, if you want to compute uh, Wilson loops observables in, uh, in this theory, uh, what you have to do is you have to take this matrix integral and insert inside some uh, some McDonald polynomials. If this was just uh, Chen Simon's theory, so if beta wa uh, was uh, was one, uh, then this would be just the standard Chen Simon's matrix model, and these uh, characters would be sure polynomials. In this uh, refined version of Chen Simon's, what you have to do you have to substitute uh, the, the characters with McDonald polynomials, and if you do that, you end up uh, uh, with all Wilson loop observables. So this is the definition of Wilson loop observables. However, we know that uh, Chen Simon's theory uh, is is not just uh, any theory; it's a theory that uh, is useful from the mathematical point of view because uh, uh, you can use it to compute uh, uh, knots invariance for the for the curves on which the Wilson loop is wrapped. And in fact, uh, uh, what uh, Ganaji and Shakirov conjectured and actually checked is that uh, these Wilson loop observables are uh, super polynomial for uh, super polynomial invariance for the for a corresponding knot. And in particular, if you just take one poly, one uh, McDonald polynomial insertion, this corresponds to insertion of a unknot, so Wilson loop that wraps the unknot, and therefore this is going to be the corresponding uh, unknot super polynomial. Okay, so let's uh, let's try to break down these constraints, these uh, qb Lazaro constraints. So as I said, uh, we observe that the measure is the same as the one on D2 times S1, but a different potential because the potential is logarithmic. And uh, what we need is that the shift operator that we introduce uh, uh, kind of interacts nicely with the, with the potential. And in fact, uh, this is surprising, but, but there is a simple observation that uh, you, can, uh, you can use is that uh, if you take the shift operator TQ and you act on the potential of Chen Simons, uh, this is basically the same as the potential multiplied by this uh, very, uh, very uh, nice coefficient. So this is going to be just uh, one over X uh, effectively. And because of this, uh, uh, you can still write down the constraints. And the constraints, uh, surprisingly, uh, are also uh, completely solvable for uh, this refinement of Simons. So what you do, you write down the constraints as uh, this uh, uh, Qubirazoro generators TN, annihilating the generating function uh, of uh, refinement Simons, so that uh, the generating function itself is, again, an highest weight for uh, Qubirazoro. And the solution uh, can be computed by, again, by recursion, and it's unique, just like in the NF equal to one and NF equal to two case. And once you do that, you can repackage everything again in terms of a super integrability formula for the average of uh, uh, McDonald polynomials. And now the, the formula is uh, slightly is this one. Uh, so this should be compared to the one in the previous case. And I can tell you that uh, the formula is basically the same. The only thing that changes is this factor in, the, in this numerator. So the idea is that now we have many examples of uh, well, we have, uh, we have at least three examples of super integrability for Q deform, QT deform matrix models, and super integrability seems to hold in all three cases uh, with just a slight modification of the of these insertion points, basically where you evaluate these characters. However, in this specific case of the function Simons, uh, this. This formula actually was already known, and in fact, this matches uh, an explicit uh, integral evaluation formula by Cherednik. Uh, the proof of this formula is very complicated, uh, but and the point is that uh, um, while deriving this formula from QB result is not a new result, uh, what is new is that uh, uh, once you take all these uh, characters evaluated at this point and you resum them into a genetic function, this allows uh, for a representation of qubit Azoro on the partition on the genetic function of uh, uh, refinement Simons, and this is uh, this is something that was not previously known. Okay, and uh, last I can mention another uh, model, uh, another uh, generalization of this. 
So instead of just computing refined chain cymos, we can also look at uh, refined ABJ. So ABJ is the physical theory uh, described by the quiver with two nodes and some bifundamental matter between them. But another alternative way to think about it is uh, as a supergroup version of the uh, refined ch of chain Simons theory. And in particular, if you do the refined version, it's going to be the supergroup version of refined chain Simons. This was observed already in uh, Kimura Nieri and in a previous paper by Nieri, Pan, and Zadzin. And if you write down the matrix integral for the partition function of this, uh, of this theory, this is again the new theory you end up with this very complicated looking integral. But what you should focus on is basically the fact that uh, on here, we have one copy for the measure of the function Simons in the X variables associated the, to the UN part. There's another copy for the Y variable associated to the UM part. So this is, a, if you want, bosonic uh, degrees of freedom and fermionic degrees of freedom. Some bifundamental matter in the denominator, which couples X and Y variables and then the potential for x and the potential for y. So in this case, uh, because if you use the fact that uh, we think of this as a supergroup version of uh, refinement Simons, then what we, what, uh, what, what we should do is to substitute McDonald polynomials with super McDonald polynomials. These were uh, uh, defined by Sergeyev and Vasilov in uh, in a, I think it's not a recent paper, like 10, 10 years ago, maybe. And, uh, and what was observed is that uh, this polynomial now, these super McDonald polynomials, uh, they also satisfy basically the same super integrability property for a function Simons. And the idea comes down to the fact that uh, uh, you can come up with a difference operator, which generalizes the usual McDonald Rusenal operator. So now instead of just shifting X by Q, we also shift uh, the y variable, but by t to the minus one. And if you write down, you can come up with some operator that does this in, uh, in some uh, nice way. And if you do it, you write down the q or constraint. And what's surprising is that it turns out that these constraints basically take the same form as those for refinement Simons that I told you about before. Uh, the only difference is that uh, you need to take the rank of the chain Simons level of uh, Refinement Simons and substitute it with some effective rank and an effective, which is the difference of n and m. So basically, bosonic and uh, fermionic degrees of freedom together with a prefactor, which is the ratio of these uh, log of parameters. So the idea is that uh, there is a, these uh, algebraic techniques allow us to, to predict uh, some sort of duality between uh, refined ABJ for nm and refined chain Simons for an effective rank, uh, which is given by this combination. So somehow these, uh, the fermionic degrees of freedom, they cancel out the bosonic ones, uh, at least partially, and you end up uh, with a simpler model, which is no longer ABJ, but it's of Gen Simon, refined Gen Simons type, but with, with, uh, with a fewer uh, number of variables. And this, is, this can be shown uh, uh, explicitly in terms of, uh, of, uh, of the generative function and uh, up to normalization. So this is a very surprising result because in this case, very little is known for refined chain Simons, uh, sorry, for refined ABJ. And this, even this uh, super integrability formula for uh, super McDonald polynomials was never uh, uh, discussed before. So this is a completely new result. And also it's interesting because this, uh, this kind of, uh, the, the fact that uh, we can use uh, algebraic uh, constraints uh, to predict the dualities for the, for the partition function itself. So as, as, I, as I discussed here in the bottom. So one last uh, thing I can mention is some symmetry of the, of the constraints. Uh, this symmetry come from the symmetry of uh, qv -Zoro. So qv is has an outer automorphism uh, that basically is just very simple. It acts uh, by exchanging the two parameters. Q is goes to t minus one and t goes to q minus one. Uh, this is the same as sending B beta to one over beta. And also you need to do this uh, uh, redefinition of the rank. Uh, but if you do this, the algebra is invariant uh, under this transformation, and therefore also the constraints are invariant. And because the solution of the constraints is uh, essentially unique, then the solution itself up to normalization must satisfy this, uh, this uh, must also be invariant under this duality. And this duality is called, uh, it has a fancy name called the quantum Q geometric Langlands. Uh, but it is just sim the simplest change of uh, exchange of these two parameters Q and T. 
And this we have been able to check explicitly. If you write down the genetic function, this is explicitly invariant under this, uh, uh, this automorphism, provided you, you also kind of relabel the times in the correct way. So why is this interesting? Well, it, the, it's interesting from a mathematical point of view, but then also it has a physical meaning. Because if you go back to a function Simons theory and we look at what Q and T mean, uh, what, what is the physical uh, interpretation, then if you remember, they were this combination, this exponential of uh, 2 pi i over k plus beta n, where k is the level and is the uh, rank of the algebra. Uh, T is this other combination. And if Q and T are chosen in such a way, then they satisfy this uh, simple identity, Q to the k, T to the n equal to 1. And, uh, and you can see that if you exchange simultaneously q goes to t minus 1, t goes to q minus 1, and k is exchanged with n, then this identity is basically left uh, unchanged. What does it mean? It means that uh, this Langlands duality that we observe for qb Rosoro is nothing but uh, uh, just an, a refined version of a 3D cyber duality, or uh, for pure chain Simon, this is uh, also known as level rank duality. So we are exchanging un at level k with uk at level n. And simultaneously, we also, whenever you have a Wilson loop, you have to exchange that Wilson loop uh, with a Wilson loop for the transport uh, representation. So this is very interesting because we are using these uh, very complicated properties for these quantum algebras to, to derive information about uh, the, the physical theory. Even though this duality was very well known, uh, the connection with uh, Langlands is uh, kind of surprising, at least to me. Okay, so... The, let me just conclude. I think I'm over a bit over time already. So to summarize what I did, what uh, we have been able to do is to give a complete solution of the QV result constraints, at least for uh, NF equal to one and two on the diagram D2 times S1 and the sphere and the three sphere. And this is a solution which is exact and uh, it's, uh, it's uh, exact and it works for any finite n. We don't need the large n expansions or anything like that. Uh, we have been able to give a semi-classical ex uh, expansion for, uh, of our genetic function in terms of emission matrix model. So as I said, this is usually called conformal limit, which reproduces the usual Virasoro constraints. And then we did something similar for a function Simons, a refined IBJ matrix models. So what is left to do? Uh, there are many things to do. Uh, here at least some of them. So let me just say in a few words. Uh, as I showed you for a function Simons, we have only been able to look at uh, uh, yeah, knots invariants for the unknot. So basically, uh, this insertion of whistle loops uh, uh, just on a trivial circle. Uh, can we do the same for uh, toric knots? So for more complicated knots, so toric knots are the uh, simplest generalization, uh, which, is not, uh, which is not trivial. And there, some partial results are known about toric uh, knot uh, matrix models but no uh, refinement uh, is known. And uh, we do not know yet how to generalize what, uh, what we've been doing so far. Another uh, uh, prospect for uh, future research is to use uh, the same strategy for some in QB Rosoro. Now, not for three-dimensional partition function, but for 5D in a class of instant of partition functions. Uh, so basically, it is known that 5D in a class of uh, should satisfy QB Rosoro constraint. This was worked out by Kimura Peston and other people before them even. Uh, but uh, if you look at the full generating function with higher times, uh, this is still uh, an explicit representation of the QB Rosoro constraint uh, has not been written down so far. Uh, however, there is a work by Nieri, Pan, and Zabzin where they expand in the in a in terms of 3D uh, partition function. And perhaps uh, using our knowledge from 3D, we can use this to solve uh, the 5D case. Um, but this is work in progress. And an added to generalization is if we look at the Chen Simons case, then uh, in, instead of just looking at Q Virazoro, we should we can also look at the elliptic Virazoro. This was defined by Fabrizio Nieri. And uh, there should be also an elliptic corresponding elliptic generalization of Chen Simons theory, which is an elliptic deformation of the function Simons. Uh, the corresponding deformation of the SNT matrix was worked out. Uh, recently, I think, by Van Dijen and Gorbe, uh, but the full uh, uh, derivation of constraints uh, for this elliptic theory uh, is, not, is not known, so this is uh, still to do. And lastly, there is also a cohomological limit, uh, which is different from the conformal limit of QB Rosoro. This is when you send Q, T to 1, 
but also the x variables are sent to one in a precise way. And if you do this, you end up with epsilon, something called epsilon virus oro. This was defined again by Ranieri and Zenkevich. And this should correspond to the uh, to the symmetries of a 2D n equal to 2 comma 2 theory. So this is now two-dimensional uh, supersymmetric field theory, which is supposedly has the same uh, uh, field content as the one that I showed you earlier with this, uh, with this quiver with one node. Uh, however, again, this is uh, still uh, work, work that needs to be done. And uh, I think with this, uh, I conclude. So thanks for the attention. Uh, thank you. Uh, are there any questions? And why in the deformed case uh, you get the deformed uh, Kuber Asoro? So, so how can you see this from this argument? There is no general pattern in the sense that, uh, or at least there is, I have no understanding of general pattern. You could even, even in the, sorry, let's go back to, if you look at this matrix integral, which is very complicated, you can still put the same operators as in the classical case. So you can put a total derivative and so on. And this, uh, if you choose the contour in, uh, without boundaries, then this will give you some word identities that uh, are still true for your model. The point is that they're uh, not easy to write down and they, you cannot solve them. So that's the only problem. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what is the operator that such that when you insert it, the word identities that you get are, uh, are nice. And by nice, I mean polynomial in the correlation function and possibly with a unique solution. But of course, you can put any operator you want, and this identity they will still hold. It's just that you don't know what to do with them. Okay, I see. So one example is you can also take the uh, finite difference operator, so this is a Q deformable operator, and insert it in the classical integral. So here, instead of your classical integral, and instead of this, we put a Q difference. This will give you again uh, something which is well defined if you take the, the contour in a proper way. Uh, some these equations are still true for your model. The point is that they look, uh, I mean, they're kind of uh, useless, or at least uh, you don't know what to do with them. But then, like, uh, depending on like what kind of operator you put, I, as I understand, you eventually discover one or another symmetry, right? Yes. So it feels like depending on how you treat your theory, you discover one or another theory, a symmetry of this theory, which is something strange or I miss something. Okay, I understand what you're saying. Um, so I think it comes down to the, again, to the form of this explicit form of this uh, equation. So you cannot think of them as, uh, Telling you that your genetic function is a is an highest weight is a representation for the for your uh, for your symmetry. So in order to say that you have a symmetry, you need to say that the genetic function is a state in a some uh, representation. And uh, if your algebra, if the algebra that, or the operators that you use is not the correct one, then you end up with some relation that cannot be written as a difference of differential operator acting on the genetic function. So you, you break down the, the structure of your representation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Maybe you could also repeat what happened with this NF uh, larger than, uh, than three. Yes. Or equal to three, so you don't have just enough constraints to solve for correlators, or there some somehow like you'll be fine, or yeah. So maybe so I can start by showing you this. So this is the uh, the form of the operator. If you take an f equal to three or higher, this is going to be a polynomial of uh, degree three or higher, basically. And the idea is that the recursion now will have a step of order three, or again higher. So the step of the recursion is the same as an f. And if the step of recursion is too large, then uh, you cannot solve it completely because uh, you will miss uh, uh, information about uh, some of the lower co correlators. So that's uh, the idea. And in fact, uh, as I was saying here, if you look at an f equal to three, you still have an infinitely many uh, equations that uh, you can look and you can solve, but sorry, but they don't give you, they, they only solve uh, for a part of your correlation, correlation function. 
and there are some uh, some other ones, some other correlation functions that you have to provide by hand. And but once you know all these other ones, so for instance, this p1 to the n, if you tell me what these are, I can apply the recursion to construct all the other one. Okay, so this is just like a feature of your method. It's not like a feature of a theory, right? So the feature is uh, like the theory still has like all correlators uniquely defined. Yes, right? yes, yes. Okay. I see. So the problem is that the equation themselves cannot be can be not be used to give a, a full uh, uh, solution. Um, but again, if if we go again uh, along along this same classical reduction, and if you look at the what's what's going to be the corresponding phenomenon in uh, in a classical case, then what you observe is that uh, for an f equal to three. These integrals are actually not well defined because uh, uh, you need to specify which contour you're, you're choosing. And there is not just a unique choice or a canonical choice, there are multiple choices. So we, we expect that something similar should happen in the QDFOM case. So mm -hmm. you can define those, those correlators, but uh, you need more information, like a prescription or uh, something like that. And this prescription is not canonical. Okay, okay, I see. Uh, I don't know. So let's let's ask again. Uh, are there any questions? Last call for questions. Okay. If there are no further questions, let's end the speaker. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you everyone for coming, and hope to see you next time. <laughs>